We worry about the mess in our financial lives. That's how the first chapter of one of my favorite books on personal finance starts. It's called Let's Talk Money. It's been written by Monica Halan. In it, she talks about the fact that our financial lives are something that we push away. It's like a task that we procrastinate on because it's so complicated and difficult to complete. But she says that the solution is to think of it in a way that is easy to understand. She says that you should think of your financial lives like a money box. And to talk about the concept of the money box, I have Monica Halan herself joining me. Thank you so much, Monica, for taking the time. And let's start with this concept of the money box. What is it and how does it make our lives easier? The insight here is just this, that if something is neatly in its place, then you're far easier able to deal with it. Be it a workstation or your kitchen cupboard or even your car uh, dashboard, right? So everybody has a place in the house where they keep all, all their money and some jewelry or, you know, there is always this one place. So I actually wanted my readers to visualize that space and think that when you think about that, is it a mess? Is everything stuffed in without any order or have you planned what you're going to put there? So similarly, you should think of a virtual money box, which takes care of your entire financial life. So if you think of that, then you start seeing that money box and you see that it's got different squares, right? It's demarcated. And every square has a purpose. So the first square, for instance, will be something called cash flow, which means do you have a cash flow system in place? If you do, you probably will have three bank accounts, an income, a spend it, and an invest it account. So that gives me clarity that I have a system in place and I'm using it. Then do you have an emergency fund? That's your second square. Then do you have a good medical insurance, life insurance, your short, medium, long-term goals, your retirement, your estate plan? So each of these is actually a square in your money box. And this is really in your imagination. And then every time you think about it, uh, one part of it, is there clarity in your own head as to what is in it? When did you last review it? And when do you not need to update it again? So you're just trying to build order and a structure in this money life. And remember, you need between 10 to 14 financial products in an average person's life. So there are a lot of products how you can best put them in the squares is this concept of a money box, Alex. So I'm glad that you brought up products because in that first chapter itself, you say that um, what to invest in or what product to buy uh, is not the first financial decision that you make. And yet a lot of people tend to make that mistake. Uh, instead, you need to start by having a good money box. And I think you alluded to that in the first answer that you gave us or the first point that you were raising, which is you need to have uh, a very clear structure in terms of how your money flows. You need to have three accounts. This is the first step that you would encourage people to take because I think a lot of people struggle with that first concept itself, which is, Monica, I don't know where my money is going. Right. Yes, Alex, this is exactly what I wanted to address. So there is a lot of help out there in terms of portfolio construction, in terms of asset allocation, diversification. But this simple insight of how do I even separate my savings from my spending? And if you can do that, and that's why I use this three bank account system to be able to have one account where all of the income flows whether it's salary, rent, interest, profit, dividend, all of that flows into that one bank account. And what you need to use during the month immediately goes to a second bank account. And whatever is left goes to a third, which is my invested account. I'm not beginning to invest yet. I'm just getting into the rhythm of separating out my savings from my spending. So the, the idea is that whatever is there in your spend it account tends to get spent. So can we separate out whether the savings is a residue or a target that's left to the reader to decide whether it's a residue or a target, but we are just separating out the savings from those uh, spending. 
we will get to investing in a while but let's practice doing this and i recommend that you do it for six months so then you you get oversight as to how much you spend are you spending too much are you spending too little both are a problem and then you start going to the next step of uh, thinking of investing but not right now i'm trying to build a very firm foundation to people's finances rather than jumping you know dropping them into the deep end and saying oh you make your asset allocation now that will come but much later yeah absolutely um, and i'm glad that we're talking about it today uh, now once you've done this and i'm assuming at this stage that uh, viewers who have not tried this will try this because incidentally i have spoken about this concept in the past um, but uh, you've mentioned uh, and right at the start uh, also of the book uh, that you've written you've written extensively about this uh, that planning for contingencies uh, Uh, emergency planning is something that is absolutely crucial uh, would you say that this concept has gotten even more reinforced on account of the pandemic and what people have experienced and how should people approach planning for emergencies alex covid brought home into each house the the problem of untimely deaths in problem of sudden job losses problem of reduced incomes everybody i think wanted access to some emergency money so the pandemic has triggered this whole emergency fund building exercise and i think it's been a great learning for even people like me who have said that maybe 6 months of emergency fund may not be a straight recommendation for all situations so maybe people in um, riskier jobs might want to put one year people in their 50s should have about 2 years of living expenses liquid in an emergency fund because you're really your uh, that cohort is at a very high risk of being laid off because of you know their salaries are high and uh, a, a, an emergency a global emergency we look at firms reasonably they will want to cut costs so you start cutting from the top you from the top management right so it is a good idea to have this emergency fund and once you understand the importance importance you also realize that the access to 6 months to 1 year of living expenses rent eating money transport money allows you to exit toxic situations whether it's an office and offices can be horribly toxic or even a marriage or a relationship or wherever you're working or at home so access to an emergency fund also allows you to exit toxic places so you know it's an added advantage of having this stash of cash ready at hand that you don't need to go through mental trauma because you don't have money to live yeah so uh i want to ask a little bit more about this because uh, i think especially in places like mumbai monica where the expenses are so high uh, and you're talking about rents that are easily more than a third of an individual's monthly take home that accumulation of a sizable emergency fund would tend to get a little difficult to do uh, at least in the very near term do you think that people should prioritize that over other goals at this stage alex you uh, are already doing 24% of your basic in terms of retirement savings if you're part of the organized sector and i would imagine most of your viewers might be part of that cohort who have a deduction of 12% of their basic and the employer matches that with 12%. So in a certain manner of speaking your long term retirement corpus building is already happening. Of course you need to do more but before I do that I want to secure my near term future you know the uh, next few years rather than worry about something which is 10 20 30 years later. so if you're already doing that provident fund contribution and you're doing that 1 and 1/2 lakh atc uh, investments and hopefully you're using something like ppf uh, and or elss to do that again that is long term then you should prioritize building your emergency fund and if you're finding that your current costs you know for instance rent and emi is far too high it will be a little bit of a, a red flag if something were to happen to your job so absolutely use this as a time to even consider 
that am I spending too much on rent today? But definitely build that, build that corpus. It honestly, when you have that emergency, Alex, and you have access to that emergency fund, it stops you from jumping off something high. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you've described this as a seat belt that you should wear, right? So uh, I think more than anything else, you need to put that seat belt on before you start driving. Um, but having said that, I want to ask about the current scenario. And, where, you know, I, I pointed this out in the headlines when I introduced the show. Uh, equity markets are in a correction mode because of everything that is happening. And you write in your book that it's important to look at equity as an asset class that should be part of your corpus because this is something that helps you build capital over the long term. And I've been happy to look at headlines that talk about the number of people that are entering the uh, equity markets, individuals. But at the same time, Monica, so many people that uh, we speak to tend to get in at the highs and then burn their fingers and then they don't want to get back in. So what advice would you give to people? How should they contend with loss of capital in the equity markets? Alex, the way that people look at equity inherently is flawed. They're looking it at it as drinking a can of some energy drink, whereas they need to look at it as eating uh, dal chawal, just eating basic food. So you need equity as your financial partner over your entire life. So there isn't a good time to enter or exit. The only control that you have is your asset allocation. How much of your net worth is in equity is the only decision that you need to take. The question of should I be in equity should not be asked anymore. Of course, you have to be in equity. Your decision is how much of my net worth is in equity. The younger you are, the more you are in equity. The older you are, the lesser is the exposure to equity simply because at some point you'll have to be living off your assets. Equity is not something that you depend upon for income. Those are debt products, whether it's government bonds, whether it's fixed deposits, whether they are debt funds, you look at those for income. Equity typically is the part of your portfolio that you don't want to look at for the next seven to 10 years. So people who have got in for that energy drink feeling are going to get the dip after the effects of the bull market runoff. But when you look at the long term return on the Indian stock market, we've got data over 40 years, the average annual return has been 14, 14 and a half percent, which is a fantastic return. But there have been periods of five years, six years where markets have done worse than fixed deposits. But then there along comes a year when you get a 100 or 150 percent jump. So you just have to be in the market and nobody can time it. I can't time it. The best fund managers cannot time it. So you always have to be in equity. Look at it like your meal. You will always have some basic things on your plate. You will have bread, you will have uh, some vegetables, you will have some dal, some meat. This is your basic diet financial diet, a part in equity, a part in debt. Uh, the house that you live in is your real estate allocation, about 10% of your portfolio diversification in gold. And then once your portfolio is large enough, then you look at overseas diversification. But please stop asking questions, viewers, should I be in equity? The answer is yes, of course, you have to be in equity. How to do it and what uh, products to buy is the questions you should be asking now. Yes, absolutely. And, and we have answers to that on this program as well. But uh, you have some very strong uh, thoughts on insurance. And I want to specifically focus on life insurance uh, because I think a lot of people will benefit from uh, the thoughts that you have on how to approach this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you very firmly believe in term insurance and term insurance only. Why is that? Because what you're trying to do is use the financial product towards a certain end. You are in control. You are not buying what they're selling. You are buying what suits you. What they're selling are bundled products, which they are bundling insurance with investments, where 90% of your premium goes towards the investment and just 10% goes towards the life cover. 
So then you need to break it up and say, what is the return that I'm getting on this 90% of my premium, which goes towards in investments. And when you unpack most of the traditional insurance plans, money back endowment, let's not even talk about whole life. That's, that's a complete trap, a whole life policy. So when you look at the average returns on these uh, products, which are sold so heavily, you realize that the returns are between two to 4% over 10 to 15 years, maybe 20 years. Your PPF gives you over 7% tax-free return. And I just said the long-term uh, index return is going to be 14, 14.5%. Worse, so one is that neither does it do well on investment. In terms of protection, it's very poor because what you will get is a very small amount of life cover. So even for, uh, you know, you'll get a five lakh life cover. But what you need is 10 times of your annual income. And should you want to buy that in one of these traditional bundle plans, the premium would equal your entire income, annual income, right? So that doesn't work. The third thing, which really, there are three, two more things. This. The third thing is that it is hard sold because of the first year commissions that the agents get. Legally, they get about 42%. Illegally, they get your entire first premium as commission. Fourth, you can't exit these policies without a cost to you. So if you exit after paying the first premium, you get zero back, nothing. You exit after paying two premiums, you get about 30% of your money back. So it's a, it's a capital loss. We're not even talking a few basis points on a debt fund. We're talking of capital losses. You've paid five premiums and you don't pay the sixth let's say it's five lakh that you've paid and you stop funding it, you get two and a half lakh rupees back. Two and a half lakh rupees remain with the company. The company can book that as profits after two years of holding it. So the agent has made money, the company makes money, you make capital losses because you bought into this trap like product. So I can only say don't destroy your very hard earned money. If you need life insurance, everybody might not need life insurance. Should you need life insurance, a term plan for a 30 year old or crore worth of some assured, which means the money that your beneficiary gets will cost seven to 10,000 rupees a year, right? So be very careful uh, and don't, please don't fall into this trap of a bundled insurance plan. I think we've covered quite a few very important concepts today. Monica, thank you so much for joining in. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Alex. Bye.